Hi all, I'm introducing ring opening metastasis polymerization, uh, otherwise known as ROP. I thought this was a very fascinating technique and wanted to dig into it. I think it's cool that you can have a monomer-like normarine, a cyclic olefin, that when polymerized uh, into polynormarine, um, maintains its double bond in the backbone and also keeps a ring structure along the backbone. I thought this was unique and wanted to dig into this. So polynorbernine, um, for there's some details about this specific polymer, it's commercially sold under the name of uh, Norcerex. It's um, used to absorb up hydrocarbons. It has an affinity to bind with hydrocarbons, which is interesting, and it's also used as a commercial elastomer. So let's first review the uh, mechanism for olefin metastasis and what happens here. So olefins and alkenes are the same thing. So those are double bonds. Um, now, you can see from this example reaction that using a transition metal catalyst and different olefins or alkenes, you can change the substituents on this olefin. So metastasis stands for meta change and thesis of place. So metastasis, these substituents are changing place about this double bond. Now this is an equilibrium reaction and will form all uh, various kinds of olefins from this. Uh, now you can see the mechanism down below. Uh, it involves a couple steps that are repeated over and over as each olefin is coordinated to the metal and then upon cycloaddition forms a metallocyclobutane which upon a cycloreversion um, the double bonds are swapped you don't get the same thing out as that necessarily came in um, and this will happen to create all four products so this is again an equilibrium reaction so the mechanism that we just saw in that last slide for olefin metastasis was developed by Yashavin in the 60s. However, the majority of developments for olefin metastasis, and specifically for ROMP, are attributed to Robert H. Grubbs and Richard R. Schrock, who developed the catalyst used for this olefin metastasis in ROMP in the mid-70s as well as the mid-80s. Uh, now, the three of these investigators together uh, were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2005 for their work uh, contributing to olefin metastasis as well as ROMP. So you can see a schematic of the general reaction for ROMP below, where we have cyclic olefins. That's the focus of ROMP, which upon, metastasis cat uh, upon being catalyzed by a metastasis catalyst, form a linear structure with double bonds in the backbone. So this is a chain growth reaction. Um, and the key advantage is that we do keep these double bonds in the backbone. Uh, and since we're using a catalyst, we've also got some, we can use michaelis minton kinetics to talk about what's, uh, what the kinetics of this reaction are. Uh, we also uh, know that this relationship between the monomer and the catalyst is very important for determining the uh, effectiveness of this ROMP technique. And these are the three steps for the polymerization of an cyclic olefin by ROMP, you can see that you start with an initial uh, metal alkadiene. So you have a metal carbene bond that uh, we, we get a coordination of the alkene to that metal, like in the same mechanism that we saw for olefin metastasis. We get the cycloaddition to that metallocyclobutane as we saw before, and we get the cycloreversion. The nice thing here, however, is that the cycloreversion is driven by ring strain. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. Now, this, the same process happens over and over, and it, the initiation starts with an alkyl group on the other side of the carbene bond. But with propagation, the metal or is uh, bound to the growing polymer chain, and we keep on inserting the monomer in between that polymer chain and that metal, just over and over in that active uh, spot way, that carbene. Uh, to terminate this, when we finally are done reacting with our monomers, we will um, react the metal with, usually it is a ethyl vinyl ether, to pull the, the metal out of solution so we don't get degradation of our polymer. So as noted earlier, this polymerization process is driven by ring strain. So we've got some example monocyclic monomers. Right. They each have their, their double bonds in them, so we have our cyclic alkenes, and you can see that for small rings and large rings, um, the change in Gibbs free energy of polymerization is negative, meaning we can get that to happen at room temperature. However, for six-membered rings, we don't see a favorable reaction. 
we can't get this reaction to happen. So the stability of six-membered rings prevents uh, romp of six-membered rings. Um, for these rings, monocyclic rings, it's important to acknowledge that there are backbiting reactions that can happen. So you will get some um, equilibrium reactions between the monomer and the polymer chain. Um, you also, you can get them for these five-membered rings as shown below. You see that it is still negative, but it's a harder reaction to pull off than for cyclobutene or uh, cyclooctene. So while we can do this romp with monocyclic monomers, it's more common to use uh, polycyclic monomers or just bicyclic monomers for romp. Uh, of course, the hallmark monomer is norbernine, and you can see the reaction is one direction in this case. Uh, the increased ring strain of a bicyclic monomer makes it not makes it very unlikely to have a reverse uh, reaction and backbiting to create the um, the monomer. Uh, we've got some other monomers here. We've got dicyclopentadiene in the top uh, right of all of these monomers. It's a dimerization of two cy uh, uh, cyclopentadienes. Um, that's a useful monomer, and we've got some norbernine derivatives. Uh, now, while we have talked about the fact that six-membered rings won't polymerize, there are some other factors that influence the polymerization of monomers in ROMP. Uh, bulky groups on the double bond will prevent the coordination of the double bond to the metal preventing polymerization. Uh, conjugated dienes will also not uh, polymerize. Uh, and we also have that electron withdrawing groups on the same ring as that double bond will prevent the uh, coordination of that double bond to the metal and then the polymerization. It is all right, however, to have uh, bulky groups and um, electron withdrawing groups on different parts of the monomer. You can see on some of these norbernine derivatives that we have fluorines um, and other groups off of the um, not active side of the monomer. This is completely valid and a useful way to add substituents to a polymer chain. Now there, there are issues with the ROMP polymerization process. Now, uh, and these mostly revolve around chain transfer. If the, the catalyst or the metal isn't discerning uh, in which double bonds it reacts with, it could react with the double bonds on the backbone of a, another polymer. Now, this will cause a interconversion of the polymer chain. So we have chain transfer to polymer, which increases the PDI of the polymer, which is not necessarily something that we want. We want a narrow PDI. Um, another issue we could have is an intramolecular uh, um, reaction where we get some backbiting. Um, this is, again, where the, the metal of the catalyst is not discerning. Uh, in this case, where we are polymerizing a, a polyoctatetraene, uh, we get backbiting that results in benzene. For other molecules, you might not get benzene, but another uh, a byproduct that has double bonds in it that can then act as another uh, source of increasing the PDI of the polymer because the metal might react with these byproducts. Uh, so we, we want to avoid uh, this chain transfer. And the question is, how do we do this? The answer lies in the selection of our catalyst. Now, we do have some options for a catalyst. We can choose heterogeneous catalysts and homogeneous catalysts, but the homogeneous catalysts are the ones that are typically used. These are in the same phase as the reactants. They are in the mixture. Um, so these are typically complexes of transition metals with ligands, right? Um, and by choosing these specific ligands, we can tune the specificity of these catalysts so that they will only react with specific double bonds within the system. They will. Um, this will encourage the decrease in chain transfer. We won't get as much of the backbiting or this uh, chain interconversion. So these are some example catalysts. On the left side, we have two catalysts that are not very specific. Uh, whereas the four, all marked with the five uh, from a specific um, review article I was reading on ROMP, these all promote a living uh, polymerization of uh, monomers by ROMP. So uh, all four of the polymers to the right, as well as the tungsten polymer, are homogeneous um, catalysts and have different specificities and different uh, 
uses based off of the metal as well as all the substituents around them. Um, specifically, the polymer in the top right. Uh, this is the grub's first catalyst. This was one of the first polymers used for uh, olefin metastasis uh, and ROMP in general, but it has been improved to right below it the third generation um, grub's catalyst. Now, this is a great catalyst and will give living polymer, uh, polymerizations of norberine and its derivatives and will give polymers with small PDIs of less than 1.1. Uh, um, of course, a living reaction. Just like other polymerization um, reactions, we have a stereochemistry and tacticity to our polymers. Now you can see that we still get the syndiotactic and the isotactic structure as well as atactic um, structures to our polymers, but that depends on the nature of the uh, puckering of the rings or the, just the orientation of the rings um, in the backbone. But the double bonds along the backbone also provide a, another element of stereochemistry in the sense that they can either be cis or trans. Um, and then there is a third component of the uh, head to tail, tail to tail, um, tail to head interactions that we could have with a monomer for uh, non-symmetric um, um, cyclic olefins. The nice thing is with most of the catalysts, we can tune the, tune the specificity of these catalysts to alter the percentage of trans and cis, as well as tacticity, and to a lesser degree, the orientation of the molecule as it uh, becomes coordinated with the um, polymer. Now with these, uh, with these double bonds along the backbone of these polymers, what's nice is we can use conventional sulfur recurring systems to vulcanize and cross-link uh, ROMP polymers along their backbone. So this makes uh, norberine elastomers and other elastomers from these polymers uh, something that are fairly easy to create, which is exciting. Uh, however, there are other structures that we can make. For example, with uh, uh, dicyclopentadiene, as shown, we can form cross-link structures. Uh, this specific polymer or cross-link structure is the commercial polyene, uh, polymer uh, telene. We also can form block copolymers using the living nature of this reaction and the tuned nature of the catalyst, uh, as shown below in the bottom left. And then we can form graft polymers, which takes advantage of the fact that the double bond uh, is not affected by other substituents off of uh, other parts of the, the bicyclic ring. So the specific graft polymer was part of a paper that talked about using uh, or attaching polypeptide sequences to a ROMP polymer backbone. Uh, but there are other ways that we can attach um, the beginning of uh, ATRP or raft polymers to a ROMP generated background um, making or backbone, making a very, very useful um, structure to orient and create graft polymers. These are my sources or primary sources for my research into ROMP. I hope you enjoyed this and thought this was uh, an interesting mechanism just like I did. Thank you.